I want to start by um, reading a quote from Karl Marx's Capital. And, and Marx didn't actually say this. He quotes another uh, economist. But I think uh, after you hear the quote, you'll understand why Marx liked it and wanted to include it in Capital. And this is um, what it says. And it really kind of, um, it's a distillation, I think, of what the 12 war is really all about. Capital shuns no profit just as nature pours a vacuum. With adequate profit, capital is very bold. A certain 10% will ensure its employment anywhere. 20% certain will produce eagerness. 50% positive audacity. 100% um, will make it ready to trample on all human laws. 300% and there is not a crime at which it will not scruple, nor a risk it will not run, even to the chance of its owner being hanged. If turbulence and strife will bring a profit, it will freely encourage both. Smuggling and the slave trade have amply proved all that is here stated. And that really, in a sense, is a distillation of what the drug war is uh, in Mexico. So what do we see happening in Mexico? Well, a lot of decapitations. I mean, this is something that is so absolutely horrendous. People have their heads chopped off. Um, in, in the drug war, sort of the new normal now in Mexico. People are hung from busy commuter bridges. I mean, imagine bodies hanging from the Bro Brooklyn Bridge with signs around their neck saying, this will happen to you if, you if you snitch on us. Bags of body parts found in highways and ditches. Uh, they've found many, many bodies dissolved in barrels of acid. They actually have the person uh, who did that. They prosecuted that person. Pregnant women and children are no longer off limits. The Sicarios, the assassins, uh, there's a, a really good book, The Sicario talks about when they change from it's now acceptable to kill pregnant women and children. So these, this is, these are human laws that will be trampled on. This is the strife and the war and the killing that the drug war allows. There's no scruples um, in the war on drugs because the capitalist system, let's be honest, Drugs are a business, right? They might be illegal, but they are a business. They're commodities that people seek. They always have, and I would argue, they always will seek out drugs. So it's about profits. It doesn't matter if the commodities are illegal. And what, what it does, as Gabriel just said, it increases the profit margins when the commodity is illegal, OK? So for example, a pound of cocaine when it's in Colombia or Peru, is about it's um, it's about two thousand dollars per pound or per kilo. When it gets to Mexico, it's worth ten thousand. When it gets to the United States, it's worth thirty thousand. If you break it down into grams, and so the people who are dealing in the United States, um, so they're distributing it, and what do they sell it in eight balls, or I can't remember the de denominations. But then that thirty thousand, when they divide it up, it makes it worth a hundred thousand dollars. It's more cocaine becomes more valuable than gold does, if you can imagine that. It's similar for marijuana, which more people in the United States use. So Mexican farmers who grow a lot of marijuana, a lot of really good marijuana, I would add, 37 bucks a pound for the Mexican farmer, that's what he or she gets. It crosses the border. It, now it's worth $700 um, a pound. And I don't know how much a dime bag is going for now in the streets of New York, but it ain't cheap. It is not, it's not oh, cheap. Dime. Not it's not a dime. Okay, so whatever it is. It hasn't been a dime in years. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I'm a little bit behind the time. So, okay, but you know, it's expensive. A couple hundred bucks, right, for like a small amount of marijuana. So this is the level of profit in that, that is available to, to the drug lords. And the Rand Corporation, uh, they did a study and they said that the gross revenue from the Mexican cartels, what they, what they make from importing drugs into the United States is around $6.6 .6 billion a year. It's a huge part of the Mexican economy. It's a vital part of, of the Mexican economy. Half a million people work in the drug trade in Mexico. Everything from growing, the farmers who grow marijuana or poppy, for the people who transport it, to the people who smuggle it through, um, through um, the border. Half a million people. That's more than three times the number of workers at Pemex, which is the large, largest oil company in Mexico. There's more workers in the drug industry than in the, in the oil industry. So how do drugs get into the United States? That's something that um, people maybe they wonder about, right? Because we spend billions of our tax dollars to somehow secure that border. Um, a 2,000 mile border we share with our neighbors, right? It's 2,000 miles long. There's now 21,000 border control agents. Um, there are drones 
there's predator drones on the border, and actually they're flying deep into Mexico now. There's fences, checkpoints, they have Black Hawk helicopters. I mean, it's a militarized border, and yet still, all these drugs get, get through. There's no, um, there's no shortage of, of marijuana or cocaine in the United States. And I want to just give you a few examples because this might be the only sort of funny or comical part of my presentation. Because when you talk about the drug war, you're talking about a lot of a lot of death. So they use snakes, um, fish, um, horses. They um, fill condoms full of drugs and they implant them in animals. Um, they've used mannequins. They put cocaine in mannequins, ship them into the United States. Um, one of my favorites, um, they were. Um, busts of Jesus, and they were made of cocaine. They were spray gray, but they were actually made of cocaine. They were importing these busts of Jesus Christ into the United States. It's really incredible. From Colombia, they put cocaine in sneakers and imported them into the country. The, the level of creativity and innovation in the drug market is really pretty stunning. And no one is probably better than it than El Chapo Guzman. El Chapo means shorty. And he is the CEO of the Sinaloa cartel, one of the most powerful cartels in Mexico, and he pioneered new ways. So his big thing was tunnels. So there were hundreds of tunnels dug underneath um, crossing the border. That's how they get a lot of drugs in. When that gets shut off, then they put them in the bodies of cars and trucks. They FedEx drugs to the United States. That's another way they've gotten here. Um, El Chapo, he opened a cannery in Guadalajara, and the cans were stamped jalapenos, but they were full of cocaine. And so it goes on and on and on. I think my favorite one, though, is um, they were catapulting 100-pound bales of marijuana over the fences. And a DEA agent said, and I'm quoting, a catapult, we've got the best fence money can buy. And they counter us with a 2,500-year-old technology. So they will stop at nothing to get the drugs <laughs> through. And it's not going to stop, because the other reason is the corruption at the border. The level of bribery and corruption at the border is staggering. There's no way, right, that drugs can get through the border without a certain level of complicity among the border patrol agents on both sides. And there's been a number of, a number of high profile arrests over the years of, of border patrol agents who just take millions and millions and millions of dollars to, to move the stuff through, to just approve cars and trucks or whatever. So right now, I don't think there's any country um, more than Mexico that shows um, the horror, the real horror of the war on drugs. So let's just look at the numbers. Over 70,000 people have been killed in Mexico directly related to drug war violence. Some people believe the number could go up as high as 120,000. And if Peña Nieto continues the drug war, that number will definitely go up. And I think he's committed to, to continuing that war. 24,000 corpses found in mass graves. 20,000 people disappear. They don't know where people don't know where their loved ones are. Um, a quarter of a million displaced. Um, Gabriel talked about the displacement in Colombia. The numbers aren't as high, so a quarter of a million trying to escape drug war violence. And I think that we have to say that these numbers are alone are a reason to stop the drug war now in Mexico. These are crimes against humanity. They're crimes against humanity. What are these people dying and disappearing for? Because we, we live in a drug-free world now, because our children are safe from drugs, people don't use drugs anymore, that is total bullshit. That is a bullshit lie, and it's a crime against humanity. It, it should be, you know, the UN should be investigating Calderon for war crimes. He's at Harvard. He's teaching and researching at Harvard University. This man who for six years presided over a massacre of the Mexican people. It's absolutely infuriating, and they don't care. The Mexican ruling class and the US ruling class, they don't care that all these people are murdered and disappeared because it's not their family, it's not their loved ones. It's, it's separate, it's separate. It's the other people over there. They're disposable. There's a whole group of people in Mexico, they're just disposable. And if you get killed in the war on drugs, it's your own fault. You had to be a part of the drug trade in some way. You were a lookout. You were paid off some way. And Calderon even said that there were 15 teenagers who were massacred at a party in Ciudad Juarez, which is the epicenter, one of the epicenters of drug war violence. He said these young people, teenagers, were thugs. He called them thugs in the national media. And he said they had to be involved somehow uh, in the drug trade. Well, fact is, it turned out they were pretty good students and, and athletes. 
And really, this is, I think, one of the most powerful ideological aspects of the war on drugs, and that is the criminalization and the demonization of people who are involved in the drug trade, even those who aren't but are suspected of being. And what, they, and what this war mentality does, this war on drugs, which is really a war on people, it's a mentality that suspends human empathy, compassion for people. Because it criminalizes people, it says you're scum. And if you get killed, you deserve what you got because you were drug trafficking. So you deserve to die. And that's something we have to fight against. It's, they're our brothers and sisters. They're, it's, the, it's the farmer who's growing marijuana and poppy. It's the unemployed person who's taking the risk to transport these drugs through Mexico, um, Colombia, um, of course, because they, they crack down on uh, co um, cocaine going into Florida. Now the cocaine is coming through, the transit routes through Mexico, which has led to just even much more violence. People need jobs. They're our brothers and sisters. We have to break down that part of the drug war, I would argue. Now, I just want to give a brief history of how the drug economy uh, actually developed in Mexico. It's going to be a really brief one. It, it's, it's actually a huge history. I, I would, I would um, encourage people to read about it because it's, it's, it's fascinating, it's scary, um, and, it, it, and it's really, it, it's, it's, it's kind, of, kind of amazing. Because Mexico wasn't always the lead uh, importer of drugs into the United States. It really came about as a, as a um, result of prohibition in the United States. So unfortunately, the drug warriors, decade after decade, they made all drugs illegal in the United States. So maybe people have heard of the Opium Exclusion Act, made op smoking opium illegal. The Harrison Act, that made cocaine and heroin, it banned um, those drugs. The Volstead Act, maybe the most well-known in 1920, which prohibited alcohol. That worked really well, right? People know what was unleashed in the United States when they banned alcohol, I mean, it did stop people from, from drinking. And then the marijuana tax in 1937. So all psychoactive substances are no longer available in the United States, sort of. Did diminish the desire for these substances, as we know. But what it did was it created a lucrative black mark in the United States. And then Mexico, because of you know the geographical proximity to the US, they said, hey, People still want drugs. We're going to fill that market. We're going to start growing and importing drugs because people still want them, and we can make a lot of money um, doing it. So sharing that border made that made it that much easier. And I think it's really just another example of kind of the push down pop up effect. That if you push drug production out of one country, it lands in another country. And I think the the um, Colombian cocaine. Um, is another good example of it. It's like you shut it off in Florida, like the Colombians can't get the cocaine to Florida, so then they find transit routes down through Latin and Central America and, and into the country in another way. So Mexico starts to ramp up production, cultivation, manufacturing, exporting of drugs to the United States. Of course, drugs are also illegal in Mexico because the United States, with its drug war tentacles, have convinced countries all over the world to make drugs illegal. So. That's one of the disadvantages of, of being uh, neighbors with the United States is that they, um, they, bu they bully Mexico and they force them to accept um, pro prohibition. But it's interesting because the narco economy that is created by US prohibition, well, of course, it creates a class of drug lords in Mexico who benefit from it, but also the Mexican state. And this is what might seem so incredible to some people, but right from the beginning, um, the party in power, the PRI, the uh, Party for Revolution, the Institutional, it's Partido Revolucionario Institucional, I'll just call it PRI. Um, they were in power in Mexico for 71 years, and they were an integral part of the drug trade in Mexico. They helped to regulate it, they um, profited from it. Um, the PRI in 1947 created uh, an institution with the urging of the United States called the DFS, so it's a, it's a secret police uh, organization modeled on the CIA. So the PRI, you've got the PRI who's involved in the drug trade, the state, federal uh, and state officials, politicians, and now you've got the DFS. So you've got these two organizations working with the drug lords, with the capos, with the bosses, and for 40 years, they basically run the drug trade together. They function, the DFS, function as an institutional protection racket. 
The DFS agents, they're involved in the largest trafficking operations in Mexico. They distribute the drugs, they export them, the sale of them. They're involved from start to finish. So you have what um, you could really call like a fusion of political and business interests between the pre and the drug cartels and with the DFS. So it's a great business. I mean, they're getting rich. This small class of people is making a lot of money just because of the profits of illegal drugs, right? And over the years, what ends up happening is a dynamic is created that positions the narco economy as a central part of the economy. They can't get rid of it because too many people are making too much money. They don't want to get rid of it. Why would you want to, right? So that goes on for 40 years. I mean, I think one of the important things to note about that is because the, the DFS and the PRI to a certain extent, they enforce sort of a rigid structure on the drug bosses. And they were able to solve differences on, around the plaza. And um, the plaza is the areas that each cartel controls. So if there were problems, the DFS and the PRI could sort of work them out. It's like, you know, you take this part, we'll traffic through this one. So there was a, a structure that was imposed on the trade which helped to regulate it. And so you didn't see nearly the level of violence under this regime as uh, I'll come on to uh, as I'll come on to later. Okay. So I'm going to skip up to 1990. 1990, and Vicente Fox is is elected. I don't know if people remember that the Coca-Cola uh, executive, so qualified to run a country, right? And he's in the PAN, the PAN party, and so. After 71 years <coughs> in power, the PRI is out, PAN is in. What this unleashed was a, um, a reorganization of the, the economy and also of the drug trade. So now the police and uh, political institutions, everything is kind of up for grabs because now the PAN uh, is in power. The PRI is sort of out of power. And the crucial thing here in terms of the narco economy is that they're no longer able the pre, because they're out of power, is no longer able to impose a structure and an order on the drug trade. There's a splintering um, in the government. And of course, the cartels um, take advantage of this, and they begin to act more autonomously. I mean, who's in power now? Who are we reporting to? Who's going to be solving um, the disagreements that we have? You see an unraveling of the PLASA system, and this leads to more turf wars and, and much, much more violence. So then, you add to that, pre's out, PAN is in, so of a deregulation of the narco economy. Then, let's go up to 1994 with NAFTA. So NAFTA is like a bomb going off in Mexico. It's like a bomb going off. I mean, the amount of suffering that NAFTA introduced into Mexico is just, it's staggering. And what it meant was the breaking up and the selling off of the state economy, right? So this is where, um, um, what's his name? The, the, the billionaire. Slim. Carlos Slim. So, you know, a whole class of billionaires is created out of NAFTA. What it does to the narco economy, um, it leads to even more rivalry and more levels, um, higher levels of extreme violence. Because once again, there's no way to settle um, differences. Um, if shipments get stolen, if, if things get lost, there's no way, because you know, you can't go to court. If you're El Chapo, you can't say, I'm gonna take you to court because you stole my cocaine. I mean, it's just, it's not, it's, that route is not available to you, right? And the other um, thing that NAFTA did was it just plunged, I think not that soon after it was implemented, like two million Mexicans fell into poverty. The impoverishment of the working class and the, and the agricultural class right. was just enormous. So who fills that gap? The drug cartels do. You're not going to grow corn and beans anymore, right? Because we don't need that. You're going to grow marijuana and poppy. And so more cultivation of these drugs, and then workers to transport and manufacture. Later, meth methamphetamine is, is manufactured there. People go to work for the drug cartels. They actually advertise. Um, the, the Zetas, they put up banners. And they say, come and work for us. I and mean, we have good wages, we have benefits. I mean, I've seen pictures of it. I mean, it's really incredible. And of course, this is a cheap, disposable workforce that has no civil rights, no human rights. You know, you don't unionize when you're a sicario, right? 
And this really works. NAFTA really was a game changer for um, the narco, uh, narco traffickers. So what is the drug war about? What it's not about is creating a drug-free world. That, that is a lie. That, is, that will never happen. We'll never live in a drug-free world. Is it about keeping people off drugs? No. People use a lot of drugs. I mean, like 300 million people around the world use drugs. Is it preventing drug abuse? No. The war on drugs has nothing to do with that. That's the rhetoric at the top of society, save the children. We have to keep drugs away from children. That, it's all lies. What it's really about in Mexico is about social control. Um, the drug war is a pretext to attack movements for social justice in Mexico. Mexico is a country of fighters. There's been fights all throughout its history for social justice, indigenous rights over land. And so the drug war is a pretext to go in and kill people and dismantle so movements for, for rights and social justice. That's what it is. It's used over and over and over again to justify the violence of, of the Mexican state. And it really works. And it, it has worked for a really, really long time in, in Mexico. So you can't talk about Mexico. I can't talk about Mexico without saying something about the US because the two are so entwined in this drug war. So for the U, this, actually this is also true for Mexico, but for the US, the drug war is a crucial piece of what they, the drug warriors do. And that is the, I call it the drug military industrial complex. So the US wants a drug war. They want to continue the drug war in, in um, Central and Latin America for two reasons. One, it allows them, it allows the US to intervene in Central and Latin America, which there's a whole history, people probably know some of that intervention, over and covert intervention into Mexico, imperialism in this part of the region. And then the second is it's really good for business, right? Businesses like Boeing, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, General Dynamics, the gun dealers all along the border. I mean, I don't know if people are aware of how many gun dealer shops are all along the border. I mean, you can buy a gun and a lot of guns at almost any time of the day or night. And they make millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and all of these corporations, I mean, the drones, the fences, right, uh, the, the guns, the, the personnel, I mean, there's a huge investment in, 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 this, in this war that they're not going to give up. So then you add on to that the militarization of the drug war and the corporations that are profiting of the death and disappearance of, of, of the Mexican people. So you've got the Drug Enforcement Administration. They have their, probably their biggest outpost is in Mexico. They've been in Mexico for decades, the Drug Enforcement Administration. You've got the ATF. What is that? Alcohol, tobacco, firearms, explosives. You've got the CIA. You've got the State Department. There's a huge ideological investment in these organizations to be in Mexico. What would they do? What would all of these organizations do if there wasn't a drug war? What would their job be? They wouldn't have jobs, right? They would not have jobs. And that's why they don't want this war uh, to end. And then I just mentioned, because Gabriel mentioned it, more and more there's a linking between um, narcos and terrorism. Because I think, I think our side has been somewhat effective in breaking down some of the rhetoric of the drug war. So you have to keep, keep coming up with new ones. And so the narco-terrorism, that somehow if you're involved in drug cultivation, production, manufacture, that you're a, a, a terrorist. Um, they're usually ramping up that rhetoric um, a lot more. So what does the drug war do? It gives governments enormous power over people's lives. Um, they can kill you in the, in the war on drugs. And who's going to stand up for you? Right? Who's going to stand up for someone who's involved in the drug trade? Right? Rare to find someone to do that anywhere in the world, not just, not just Mexico. Um, and they can put you in prison for a really long time, which is a whole other profit sector. Not so much in Mexico, I don't think, though that, that could change, but certainly in the United States. So they won't give up. They will not give up this war. Why would they give it up if they're making all these profits? And ideologically, they're able to divide and conquer people. They use an army of lies to do this, and they've been getting away with it. That's why they so strenuously oppose legalization. They hear that word, they go crazy. They hear the L word, they go nuts. Because legalization would be the end of their power, right? If you legalize drugs, you take away that power from them. And that's really kind of what I want to 
I want to end on that I believe that legalization of all drugs is the only way to end the violence, the only way to take away the power, not only from the, the narco traffickers, but also from the state, the American state, the Mexican state, the Afghan state, whatever it is. Thank you. That's the only way to do it. And so let me just say something about decriminalization, because we kind of hear both. We hear decriminalization, legalization. Well, decriminalization is illogical, because there's a, I've tried to show there's a chain, there's a drug chain from cultivation, manufacture, transportation, and smuggling. And then there's the end user, there's us, right? So if you just decriminalize small amounts of marijuana, small amounts of cocaine or opium, you're still a criminal. You're still, you have to go back here to the criminal market to get your drugs. You're still, so maybe the penalty is less. It's not totally unimportant, but we have to legalize every step of the way because I don't want my brothers and sisters who are forced, I don't think anybody willingly um, works in drug, the, the drug trade. I don't think farmers, like that's the first thing they want to grow, isn't there? I mean, I don't know, maybe I could be wrong. No, there are. There, there might be, but given, given the circumstances, it's, it's a difficult situation. So I, I want every step of the way to be legalized so that if you're using drugs, you don't have to go to the criminal underworld that doesn't make sense, it's illogical. Um, but the presidents of Latin and Central America, it's really interesting because the discussion has been opened up probably for the first time ever about legalization and uh, decriminalization. Uh, the presidents of Guatemala, Colombia, Santos, um, Costa Rica, Paraguay is going to legalize completely marijuana. They're setting up a state um, regulated system to do it, which is really important. They've all raised all these issues that I've talked about, the murders, the disappearance, they're saying that war on drugs is not working. 40 years, what do we have to show for it? Planned Columbia, total disaster, what do we have to show for it? So they've raised legalization and decriminalization. They raised it in Cartagena, in Colombia, about six months ago. Um, Obama went there, he said, no way. He said, well, we can have a conversation, but we're really not going to. Kind of said, talked out of both sides of his mouth. He sent Joe Biden to do that too. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. And then um, they just finished up the uh, Organization of American States um, met in Guatemala. And so then you really saw the power of the United States, although the mainstream media is not reporting on it yet. But people were really hoping at, the, at this meeting of the OAS that legalization, or at least decriminalization, would really be put on the agenda in a serious, serious way. But it wasn't, in fact, Again, the mainstream is reporting this, but you know a lot of stuff goes on behind the scenes that you'll find out later about what they really said. Um, who was it? John Kerry was there. And so it was raised, but the majority of, of um, politicians, presidents said, no, we can't legalize. They're saying, no, we can't continue the way that we are, but no, we can't legalize. So where does that leave you? It doesn't, le it does, it doesn't leave you anywhere. They're saying, we, can't, we cannot legalize. Um, Okay, and so um, legalization was dismissed, which is really interesting because we just legalized marijuana in two states in the United States, in um, Colorado and Washington State, which is enormously important because it's gonna be a beacon for Latin and Central America when and if they decide to stand up. I mean, US, the hypocrite, right? The drug warriors, drug cops of the world. How is it that in the United States you can legalize marijuana, but you're telling us that we can't do it. So that's a really important break, um, I think, um, in the drug war. So the only way I think that legalization will ever happen is if mass social movements are built in these countries. They have to do it here, they have to do it there, because these presidents, they talk a good talk, you listen to them, you're like, wow, they're really radical, but will they go up against the United States? Will these presidents stand up against Obama and the next president and say, we're not following you anymore. I don't think a lot of them will do that. And I think the only thing that could is a mass social movement. So in Mexico, that movement has begun, and that is the movement um, started by Javier Cecilia. His son was murdered by drug, 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 aid, drug lords. And um, his movement for peace and justice with dignis, dignity is, is enormously important. It has to get bigger. It has to get angrier. It has to get louder. You can't just talk about peace. You have to talk about what the state is doing. And they're going to have to confront the Mexican state, just like we're going to have to confront the, the US state to legalize all drugs. It's an, an important start. But without that, 
I don't think in Central and Latin America that you're really going to get a, a, a true um, a solution to the war on drugs until a movement, and that's that's hard, right? Because of all of the problems around the drug war. But until we have that, maybe we'll have a few reforms here and there. They'll be taken back. You know, maybe one drug will be legalized, but that's not good enough. Everything has to be legalized and regulated. So we have to build a social movement uh, to make this happen. I'll just end there. Thank you.